Hello, and welcome to Lecture 5 of the Interactions Unit in Phys 1104. The last lecture was quite focused on non-dissipative interactions, and so in this one we're going to look at dissipative interactions. Let's talk about why dissipative interactions are irreversible. So here's a very simple dissipative interaction, a block or something that's sliding across a floor, and so it eventually comes to rest because of friction. And I'm sure you realize that as it goes across the floor because of the friction, it warms up a little bit, and the floor warms up a little bit too. And so if we want to have a closed system to talk about, we have to include both the block and the floor in our system. If we do that, then we can talk about there being initially kinetic energy in the system, and at the end, there's thermal energy in the system. And it has stayed in the system because we've included the floor in our system. So that's the forward process. Why is it that the reverse process never happens? I think you can agree with me that we never see this happen. We do not have a warm block and a warm floor, and they suddenly spontaneously cool down and the block starts moving across the floor so that we convert thermal energy into kinetic energy. That simply does not happen. But why? The reason it never happens really has more to do with probability than anything else, but the probabilities are so staggeringly large or staggeringly small that they're basically certainties. So think of the block and the floor on the atomic scale. So here are atoms of the block and here are atoms of the floor. And if they have a whole lot of thermal energy, then they're all jiggling around essentially randomly. And so every atom is at any point moving in some velocity in a more or less random direction. And that means, to the extent that they're in contact, because remember all contact means is that the atoms are fairly close together and they're within their interaction ranges of each other, but what what would have to happen for the block to just start sliding that way is that all of the atoms in the surface of the floor would have to just happen to be going in one direction at one instant so that they all give the block a nice big jostle in that direction and get it going. Well, the likelihood of this huge number, perhaps a mole or so of atoms, all jiggling in random directions and suddenly happening to all be going in one direction, the probability of that is so small it just will never happen. And so this is why this is an irreversible process, because the probability of the reverse process happening is just so remarkably tiny. So once again, for a closed system, the change in energy is zero and we can express that as a sum in the different types of energies. Let's specialize that to some different cases. So for example, in an inelastic collision that's closed and isolated, so it's inelastic, there will be kinetic energy lost, and that's going to wind up as thermal energy. Because this is an irreversible process, we shouldn't be producing any potential energy, and so all we should have is this. Or in other words, that the change in kinetic energy is the negative of the change in thermal energy. Often we want to know the thermal energy produced in an inelastic collision, and so let's do that. Let's write our change in thermal energy as the negative of the change in kinetic energy. Now remember that the kinetic energy can be written as a kinetic energy of the center of mass plus, and in a two-object collision, a half mu v12 squared, where that's the relative speed, v12. All right, well, if this system is isolated, then the center of mass continues to move at a constant velocity. And remember that this kcm is a half 
the mass of the system or the inertia of the system times the center of mass velocity squared. So that's staying constant. And so our delta k is going to be our change in k center of mass plus our change in the half mu v12 squared. But vcm doesn't change and so the change in the kinetic energy of the center of mass is zero and so all we have to worry about is this part. So that is going to be a final minus an initial as usual. So a half the reduced mass the final relative speed squared minus a half the reduced mass times the initial relative speed squared. And so notice that the coefficient of restitution is just V12F over V12I, or in other words, V12F is just E V12I. So I'm going to plug that in here and plug all of that up into the delta E thermal. So our delta E thermal now is negative delta K. So that's going to be, and now I'm going to replace V12F I'm going to factor out the a half mu and carry the negative through, which is just going to re reverse the order here. And I have a common factor of V12I squared, so I can write this this way. And so if I know the coefficient of restitution and the initial relative speed of the objects in the collision, I can very quickly get the, the production of thermal energy in my system. All right, so somebody let Bender drive, and now the Planet Express ship is crashing into a comet. So I've just made some stuff up. These, these velocities are pretty typical uh, interplanetary orbital velocities, so that's actually perhaps reasonable. The Planet Express ship is about the size maybe of a small yacht, and looking things up about that, I, found, I find that 5,000 tons, or 5 times 10 to the 6 kilograms, is perhaps reasonable. Comets vary a lot in inertia. 1 times 10 to the 7 kilograms is a pretty small one. These two velocities give us a relative speed of 20 kilometers per second, or 2 times 10 to the 4 meters per second. And what I want to know here is how much the comet warms up in this collision. Well, you may know the definition of a calorie. A calorie is the amount of energy, which would be thermal energy, required to increase the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. And it's about 4.2 joules. So we would say it's 4.2 joules per gram degree Celsius, or it's usually in Kelvin, right? But that's the same size unit. So I'll call it Kelvin. So what we first want to figure out is how much thermal energy is produced here. Well, we know how to do that, that this is just an inelastic collision. I totally made up this coefficient of restitution. So we just found that we should be able to get it this way. And that mu is the reduced mass, like so. And if you plug that all into your calculator, calculator you'll get 5.6 times 10 to the 14 joules. Yeah, orbital speed collisions are pretty energetic, eh? Well, how much of that ends up in the comet? I have no idea. Let's say half, right? Why not? So we get 2.8 times 10 to the 14 joules of thermal energy 
in the comet out of this collision. And let's see how much that warms the comet up. What do we have to do? If we take our E thermal and divide by one calorie, then we end up with something in joules divided by joules per gram Kelvin, or in other words, we get something in gram Kelvins. So we would now have to divide by the inertia of the comet to get a change in temperature. And we'd want to work in grams, right? So this is 1 times 10 to the 10 grams. All right, so all I have to do is take this 2.8, so this is our delta T, is going to be 2.8 times 10 to the 14 joules, all divided by the 4.2 joules per gram Kelvin. And then I have to further divide that by my inertia, the 1 times 10 to the 10 grams. And if you just look at that, this is still going to be really big, right? Because we've got 10 to the 14 divided by 10 to the 10. That's still 10 to the 4 divided by a little bit of change. It ends up coming out as about 6.7 times 10 to the 3 Kelvin. Well, the comet heats up by 6,700 Kelvins. We've vaporized it.